Welcome to Life in the Law. I'm Marianne Sasaki. Uh, I'm delighted today to have one of the finest legal minds in Hawaii with me. I'm so lucky to have him. Miles Bryner, welcome, Miles. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for the paid comment. And no, it's totally. <laughs> I, 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 many a person has told me they thought you had the fine, one of the finest legal minds in in the county. So I was limited to the county. There you okay. go. The island of Oahu. But, yeah. Okay. So, um, so I'm gl so glad you're here, and I know mm -hmm. you have a very busy schedule, and you're in court all the time. And so I enjoy you. coming to these sessions with you. Thank you. So I asked Miles to talk about the Bundy, uh, the Bundy case. Uh, if anybody's not familiar with the Bundy case, there was a, gr it was a group of armed men. Um, how many? I think it was 11 armed men That's took right. over the or Oregon Malheur, Malheur <laughs> National Wildlife Refuge um, for 41 days. And they were armed. And they were openly occupying gov government territory. And you would think something bad would happen if that, if, if, if Well, someone did was that. killed, ultimately. No, somebody was killed, yeah. That's but, true. but t I mean, something, you might, you would think, oh, you shouldn't really be standing around government land with an open firearm defining, defying the government. But the jury found them innocent. The right jury, the right, the right uh, defendant. I want, yeah, I want you to explain. It, do you do you think that? Well, first of all, you think the U.S. Attorney made? Well, you do think. Well, was, I, I think the U.S. Attorney's Office made a grave error. They decided to overcharge the case. Um, by that I mean uh, they were charged with criminal trespass. Uh, excuse me, criminal impede, conspiracy to criminally impede access to the wildlife reserve, which is interesting because the reserve was created by Theodore Roosevelt, I think, in uh, 1908. Uh, and it's rather an isolated area. There aren't a lot of people. No. Uh, it's just basically a nature preserve, um, which by its very definition, hardly anyone's there. And only a few people that work for the government that would maintain, you know, uh, security. Uh, right. It's a, it's a wildlife preserve. In the it's, middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's in, in Oregon. Yeah. So you have property in the middle of nowhere. So it's sort of ironic that the government charged the conspiracy to impede access by the employees. What they should have charged was, or kept that charge, but had a lesser included uh, criminal trespass, which is a misdemeanor. But there was never on the table. And the individuals that occupied um, the uh, wildlife reserve were being charged with felonies. They were also, the same individuals, were Second Amendment uh, advocates. Right, right. Uh, and they felt very... Um, patriots. They patriots. called themselves pa patriots. The patriots. Well, part of this is a, is a variation of the uh, sagebrush revolution right. from the 70s and 80s. Right. And it's kind of carryover that now has kind of morphed into a Second Amendment so sovereign citizen movement right. that spread across the country. But this is what I don't understand. I don't understand if they all agreed to go to this wildlife refuge with, with guns, how can there not be a conspiracy? I mean, what... What well, do you need for, you know? The government charged conspiracy to impede the employees getting access to the refuge. Okay. okay. And uh, the, uh, according to what I've read, and I listened to a podcast at the, from the defense attorney after the uh, verdict came back acquitting his clients, uh, the government never issued an actual judicial order instructing the 41 people who occupy the refuge to vacate. Right. Instead, they surrounded the refuge and essentially created a, kind of a double barricade. You have people armed that are inside that are not coming out and they're right. not necessarily impeding anyone. Right. And then the government surrounding them and it took on more of a military operation. Right. They didn't. They w didn't want to have like uh, that. That. What, Waco, in Texas? Waco, Texas. They didn't want to have yeah, that kind of stand right, With the Branch Davidians yeah. and so on. So they were very sensitive to that. They didn't want anyone getting shot, which still someone did get shot and killed. Uh, Plus, the government's well aware that that part of the United States, Oregon and northwestern part of the United States, uh, there's a, a strong sovereign citizen movement. There's a very, very strong right-wing Second Amendment movement. And it kind of morphed into um, a cause right. celebrated that didn't have to be a cause had right. it been handled differently by the government. And as, I, as I said, the, the critical issue for the occupiers was protesting how the federal government controls access to federal lands. Right. Okay. And these well, are it ranchers. started out, though, that they were protesting ranchers who had, Correct. Right, who had uh, accessed federal land and, I guess, burned something down or... Uh, did, but, did, uh, but a different, a different uh, area. Right, right, right. right. That, that, were, that's how it began. Right, right. and Bundy and his group uh, went there in support of them. But they also went there 
to express their their Second Amendment rights to carry mm -hmm. arms openly. They weren't concealed arms. They were, no, they no, were, no. Uh, they were displaying them openly, yes, that's right. uh, which is fully their right. Had they been convicted of the felony, and this was kind of foolish, the government drove, you know, essentially this case forward. Charging a felony per, caused all these people to go to trial. Had they offered a misdemeanor, they could have kept their, their license to have the firearms, and it wouldn't have been a Second Amendment issue. So they, they, what they had was a, a, individuals protesting as a variation from the, the 70s and 80s, the sagebrush movement right. that now morphed into more of a national statement right. about us versus the government, right. you know, David versus Goliath kind of right. uh, scenario. And you append to that this issue of Second Amendment, and that gets everyone going, especially in light of, uh, of our pleasant uh, present political It gets me going, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's the I, same I, yeah. nonsense that the Trump campaign has been pushing, right. that, that, uh, that Clinton is anti-Second Amendment, which is ludicrous. She's never right. been anti-Second Amendment. She's been anti-letting people have guns without proper checks and right. proper protocols. Right. She's actually pretty um, centrist, I think, uh, with respect to guns. Yeah, she is, She's definitely. far to the right of me, anyway. And myself also. I mean, I, I would prefer the you know, no guns. But yeah. That's, you know. Right. I know that that's a that's an idea whose uh, idea whose time is come and gone apparently. But um, you know, it's funny. I this case uh, took me. It really moved me because it really uh, expressed to me the the jury nullification of the case, which I, that's what I view it as, a jury nullification. And, and I don't disagree with you. My first reaction was jury nullification, but when you talk to or listen to the defense attorneys, their take on their own case, they don't see it as jury nullification. They saw it as clear-cut from the very beginning. This was the result right. that they expected to get, given the community that it occurred in, the, the position of the Bundys and the other ranchers, and the sympathy they had in the community. They it always intended it to go this direction. Right. Well... Well, I didn't see that. I didn't see the interview with the defense attorney. But, you know, what I read was that they actually didn't have, originally they didn't have the sympathy of the local local people, but over the course of time they, mm -hmm. they gained the sympathy of the local people. But um, Well, two, I, thi two things happened. Okay. Long-term incarceration of the defendants, so getting them out on bail and um, kind of desensitizing the community to their plight, they became the focus of the community that they're still in custody over this issue. The second was the overcharging of the case, the high bail, and so on. I mean, Why did they do that, do you think, the government? The government's extremely sensitive to uh, white supremacy movements. They're sensitive to right. secessionist movements, and they want to... This was a high-profile case, too. Precisely. Right. Plus, there's been a number of individuals associated with um, similar movements from that part of the country that have been involved in actual armed action against the government. Mm -hmm. So I think in an overabundance of caution, they decided to throw, put all their eggs into one basket and not compromise, not offer a uh, opportunity for these people to avoid getting uh, convicted. Right. But don't you think this, I think this case is emblematic of this um, uh, anxiety of a certain segment of the United States, um, a certain white segment of the United States. Uh, you know, I was, think, it, it, I was thinking, it, it's almost like a divided society where the, there's there's a there's a working class or a, a you know non elite class you know who value who has certain values and who trust the, don't trust the government and they're very disgruntled and then there's this like elite meritocratic portion who's, mm -hmm. who's who are doing well who are faring well in the economy who uh, you know it, it, it just well, isn't this what Trump's trying to exploit? Right. He's part of the 1%. Right. That's right. amazing. Right. How, however you, his taxes play out and whether he has the money, he's had the ability to be in that 1% category. Right. Did you and ever doubt his taxes? I never did. I assumed he didn't pay any taxes. He's a businessman. I mean, I'm a business lawyer. You, if you don't have to pay them, you don't pay them. It's, it's clear as day. It's how we, well, there's, there's certain issues about Well, how, it's true, how he, he pushed have, the uh, envelope, apparently, right. with respect to the loophole he used. Correct, right. correct. Right. And then right. amateurizing his losses over, right. over a 18-year period. But he's no uh, white working class hero, although no, he... No, but he's managed to, char to characterize himself as, you know, the hero of the, uh, the unrepresented, the silent majority that Nixon right. often talked about. Right. Uh, but he's, but he's, he marginalizes his own, his own party, or I should say he marginalizes his own campaign by focusing on people that uh, that are angry, pissed off, uh, you said identified as you know 
white males in right. a certain category. Right. Um, it's interesting, the, the, the people that still support him, even the women that still support him still is rather uh, strange I think the women bizarre. that support him are fascinating. I can, I can never pass up a, an interview with a woman that supports Trump. You know, blonde and too much makeup? Yeah, that's usually <laughs> that, or, or a little frumpy sometimes. But, but um, uh, you know, they're responding to this. Uh, and, you know, I can understand why they feel that there's this cabal in Washington, you know, that, that controls everything and there's no actual the choice. Donald Trump participated. I mean, their, their interviews going right. back to the, the late 80s, 90s, all the way up to the present, where he's touting his connection to the, uh, to the Clintons. In fact, he, oh, he, he, he was bragging that he's more of a, you know, a uh, sexual provocateur than uh, the former president, right. uh, Bill Clinton. Yeah, and the Clintons were, the pictures of Clintons at uh, his wedding, and he uh, donated to Hillary Clinton's senatorial campaign. Yeah, so it's really... The man has no shame. It's and amazing. he is an opportunist. And it's kind of frightening because he doesn't seem to realize what he's unleashing. I mean, the notion that he's not going to give credence to the election, whatever happens one mm -hmm. way or the other, that he's waiting to keep us all in suspense, that this mentality, the manipulation, or still, um, he's like a, 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 a carny, you Like know, a P.T. Barnum. A bit like that, because he's still promoting his product. I mean, here right. he is on the, on the eve of the election, yet he opens his hotel in, in uh, the you know, former chamber of the right. uh, U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce building in D.C. Um, I used to work in D.C. I've been in that building many times. It's kind of uh, regretful that it's now going to be a Trump hotel. It, it, the, I really never thought I would witness this um, seamless merging of capitalism and uh, politics and U.S. Po you know, you, oh, capitalism and U.S. politics always hand in hand from mm -hmm. the beginning, really. You know, we're talking about white uh, landowners who developed the system, there was always a place for capitalism in, 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 the, in the system. So, although cap there probably was no capitalism when they, when they started, right? Capitalism. But I mean, this notion that, that, um, that, that Hillary shouldn't be trusted, I still don't understand the public concern over emails. I could care less. And the right. majority of people that really think about the emails, the fact she had a private you know, uh, email service, you know, and so forth, and, and, and the recent release by uh, the FBI well, of you know, additional I emails. Well, you know, it's emblematic uh, of her um, need for secrecy, and I, that worries me in, in a president. Oh. I mean, the, 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 you so need secrecy that you, like my husband is an IT guy, and he's like, she had a server in her house. Well, That's like really going well, to great lengths. But look at the last 25 years. The, well, Clinton, yeah. the Clintons have been the punching bag for the right wing. I agree. You know, from the Republicans for 25 years. And whatever, I mean, going back to the, uh, the travel gate, they're right. in office for, for less than six months. He's already been accused of sex, sexual, you know, mis misconduct uh -huh. when he was governor. The, right. the Jennifer Flowers case, mm -hmm. you know, the promoting that uh, across the country, sending out, uh, they put notices in newspapers, ran it for weeks on end. If you've ever been sexually assaulted by oh a yeah, they were governor, looking for people. I remember it they're well. They're trolling, trolling for cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the same time, going after. Hillary for what was Travelgate and right. it continued through the entire eight year uh, right. of his presidency. Vast, she's called it a vast right wing conspiracy, and it actually was a vast right wing conspiracy. I, I, I believe her. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to take a But the irony quick is that some, mm -hmm. of the, some of the people that were part of that vast right wing conspiracy are now rejecting Trump and reluctantly supporting her. Right. That's funny. <laughs> That's, That's ironic. I know. I know. <laughs> we're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, the dire straits of the Republican Party. Couldn't, couldn't happen to a nicer party. <laughs> Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m. where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. Aloha, I am Reg Baker and I am the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 in the Think Tech studios in downtown Honolulu. We highlight successful stories about businesses and individuals and learn their secrets to success. I hope you can join us on our next show on Thursday at 2 o'clock.
Until then, aloha. Hi, you're watching Life in Low. I'm with legal scholar Miles Breiner, <laughs> who is making some points that I thought were better made on camera, off camera to me. So we're talking about Hillary. Clinton. Yes, we're talking about and Hillary's I, and, emails. I, I can't be in the minority. I really, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't care about her emails. I think Bernie Sanders said enough of the emails. Don't you think the right. Democratic National Committee or? Like this thing that just came out with Donna Brazile mm -hmm. giving her questions and Debbie Wasserman Schultz with her finger on the scale. Don't you think that that's problematic? No. I do. I, I listen, think, I'm almost super see, liberal and I, I think it's problematic. I think it's problematic of our political system. That that's the way it works? It didn't uh, work that way for Bernie Sanders, though. Well, <laughs> Bernie alienates on his own. You can't be screaming, I'm a socialist, and want to... Uh, uh, right, then have the, the structure of the DNC but have your back. Exactly. Okay. But, but he managed to raise issues that are still relevant. Right. Um, oh, he did a good job. Universal free education. Yeah. I, I, I can support that. I mean, look at uh, in the Netherlands where they have universal education. So the highest literacy in the no world. They give you no pause whatsoever? They give you no... Really? Seriously? They don't. Oh, that's I see much worse. No, I, and oh, I, you and see I, much worse. And well, maybe on, I'm I, very sheltered. I worked on Capitol Hill for five years as a speechwriter on the House side and on the Senate side, and I saw much worse from really? both sides of the party. Well, I mean, that might be so, but that th that doesn't mean, you this know... This pales in comparison to other things I've seen. Well, I am sure it does, but, but it but Alexander that doesn't Hain make declaring it right. that he's in charge? That was the greatest minute. <laughs> That was like the greatest minute of, of, of no. succession uh, 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 gossip ever. No. Or, or, or uh, Jerry Ford, you know, um, uh, exonerating, the, you know, Nixon. Right, right, right. But, right. yeah, well, but I and still... If someone I, should have gone to jail, it should have been Nixon. Well, yeah, oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's managed, we managed to retool his image, so now historically he was a great, you know, president because of what he did internationally. That, if you remember policy. Nixon, <laughs> you, you have to. If, as long as there are those of us alive who still remember the Richard my, Nixon, my <laughs> my number came up for the draft, and I was already prepared to split. I was living in uh, Michigan, and I was going to cross the border to Canada, and about a. Two or three weeks later, the draft was canceled. Really? Wow. I was not going to go serve. No. No, 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 no. But, I mean, Richard Nixon was a I was prepared to, I was prepared to immigrate to Israel and volunteer and go into the IDF, but I would not go to Vietnam. Masa the Mossad for you. There you go. The elite force <laughs> only. Um, so... No, my, my, my niece is a sniper in the Israeli army. Is she? So I think so. everybody should do government service. I think Israel has it right. I don't know that everyone should go into the army for, what is it, two no, years? Some, no, it's some form of government service. Yeah, some form of government service. And then you're entitled absolutely. to free education. Yes, absolutely. And it makes you feel a part of the government. I mean, I hate to say kids today, but there, I know a whole host of 20-year-olds that feel like, this has nothing to do with me. I, I know an 18-year-old just right off to college, you would think, the greatest thing you can do is vote, right? It's one of your most significant. It's well, your most significant. I, I know. Power I've, as a I've come full circle because I, I I endorse the notion of government service in some form mm -hmm. as a vehicle for citizenship, for fully enfranchised citizenship. Right. Uh, you know, medical, national uh, health care, uh, free education through graduate school, from K through high school, through college and graduate school. We benefit from that. Right. Uh, look at look at uh, Sweden. Sweden, the Netherlands. Yeah, really. Israel. Right, right, right. So, yeah, so th I th definitely think it would give the youth a more of a, a, a sense of participation in actually constructing what, what exists. They, they don't feel that. They did a little with Obama, actually. Obama made people feel that way. That that they their voice was really going to be heard and their their needs were going to be addressed, but if, he didn't do it actually. If Michelle, if Michelle had run, would you vote for her? Oh, I vote for her in a, minute. In a heartbeat. Yeah. She's 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 like phenomenal. Yeah, she is. He, well, you know, President Obama made a speech yesterday in which he said that uh, Michelle Obama wasn't his equal; she was his superior. And I kind of feel like that's true because mm -hmm. you know you know I went to Harvard Law School, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're a black woman and you got into Harvard Law School and it was whatever 1990 or whenever she got in mm -hmm. that is one smart woman that is one, a woman that is a, excelled on every every 
plane that you could possibly excel on. Because it, I went during that period too, and it was still incredibly closed, incredibly, incredibly white, incredibly, uh, you know, averse to different opinions. So uh, I mean, I give her a lot of credit. I really, really do. I, I don't think she she'd run though. Do you? She's too no. smart to run. Yeah. She's like, why do I need this aggravation? I can do other she things. She can do more as a private citizen, especially as a former first lady. Well, what do you think about the situation with the Supreme Court and the Senate refusing to advise and <coughs> consent? It's outrageous. It There's is a, outrageous. I mean, we have someone, Merrick Garland's been uh, nominated. They should vote on it one way or the other and we move forward. Uh, to hold it up like this all okay. this time is really okay. inappropriate. Okay, I'm, I'm going to explain to the audience how the nominations of Supreme Court justices work. The executive branch, the president, selects a candidate, and um, he, with the advice and consent of the candidate, that person is appointed, is appointed the right word? Appointed to justice? Correct. Okay, is appointed to, to justice. Now, currently, the Senate is stonewalled. Well, so I sh that, that's, a, that's my opinion. The, the, the Senate is saying, because it's the very last months of President Obama's presidency, that and he's a lame duck, that they don't have to advise and consent because there's going to be a new president. And the, But there's no rule. This is no rule. No, they but, made this because, up. Because Republicans are the majority on the Senate side, they can slow the entire process down. Right, that's what they did. Can you, they, imagine, can you imagine Donald Trump appointing someone to the Supreme Court? No. Keep in, keeping in mind that he attacked a, a, Latin, a Latino judge. For, I know, but was born in Ohio. Born in Ohio. But I don't think, honestly, I don't think Donald Trump understands how the Supreme Court works and what it does and has ever read an opinion or, I, I really don't well, think so. Well, other than a book that was ghostwritten for him, his autobiography, right, right, The Deal, right, right. The Art of the Deal, uh, I don't think he's read anything else. Yeah, I don't think he understands the mechanics of the yeah. court. I think he would just appoint people that he uh, wanted to give some kind of plum, plum favorite favoritism toward or whatever. But I, it's, it'll be interesting, interesting to see who Hillary Clinton appoints because President Clinton, Bill Clinton, appointed Nadine Ginsburg, who's like, well, I, like, I love her, one of the greatest. And I wonder if Hillary's going to go that liberal, if she's going to, you know, go that left. Because Merrick Garland is, a, you know, I'm hoping, he's a, I'm hoping she appoints someone other than Merrick Garland. Gar yeah. Garland was a compromise. Yeah. You know, because he is certainly conservative. His opinions, uh, they're available to read online, right. are, are, are not liberal opinions. No, they're not. They're no. pro-government. Yeah. Um, I think he's a... A registered I, Republican. I think he's a Republican. Yeah. No, I'm hoping it'll be a female. Yeah, me too. I think. It, it, I mean, I think it's time that the the court had a majority of females. That would be that would be a majority, right? Correct. Yeah. But yeah. getting back to Donald Trump, I read the other day and a female that, that um, uh, writer described him as the uh, the Minotaur at the end of the maze. Donald <laughs> Trump. As the bullheaded Minotaur at the oh, end God, of the maze. Oh God, that's funny. That's interesting. Which, in some respects, he is. He's. He has no answer except believe in me, which was more reminiscent of Mussolini. Well, I, yeah, I did a show um, on that, you know, the, the, another, and a long, uh, several months ago, before everybody sort of made, started making these analogies that, you know, what he was really representing was, was fascism, what, what he was advocating in terms of uniting the country, isolationism with, with trade, um, suspicion of the foreign, it's really smacks but focusing on himself. I mean, it's a, a cult of personality because everything comes, I can fix this. So when he talks not about we can do this, but only I can do this, you're creating the cult of person, uh, right. personality, which right. is typical of Hitler, Mussolini, Mussolini just right. about every dictator right. you know, creates the illusion that only they have the answers, right. whatever those answers right. are. Right. To me, it was so clear. I mean, the, co the comparison was, 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 was so vivid. And, you know, I, I, I remember saying... So why do so many people well, support? I would think, how did it give, happen given his behavior time? and things he said, that, his, that the percentage points between Clinton and Trump in my mind, should be vast. Instead, I agree. it's collapsing, getting closer and closer. It's getting closer because of because of the Comey, James Comey. Um, I Which think, is outrageous. I think we yes. <laughs> I, I don't know. We may not have said it on camera. We certainly said it off camera. But yeah, James Comey's actions, releasing uh, news about emails that he has no idea the content. They, they were the, never reviewed. Which he has no idea of the content. I think I mean, that would be the right. When they are finally sure. reviewed, they may have nothing to do with anything. They may have nothing. That, right. Remember, they're, they're on the email between uh, former Congressman Weiner and his wife. Right. Whom Ab Abbott did. That's right. right. And, 
you know. You pity her. I, I pity her, <laughs> but you know, I, he, I have to tell you, Anthony Weiner broke getting. my heart, man. He, I was such a supporter of his. I thought he was the greatest legislator. And th this. And you support him when he, when he, after the, the, sca the. After the first scandal, I yeah. supported him for mayor. Right. After the second scandal, and then he not did it so again. Much. Yeah. I no. Mean, no. As That's a, such a self-destructive element right. in, in his personality. Right. right. It's not even what uh, you know. Well, what he's doing is offensive. It's very offensive. But but the fact that he has no self-control whatsoever. You, I mean, you don't want that in a leader. That's you, you, like that's one thing that's great about Obama. He's like the epitome of self-control. I don't think I've ever seen well, a more self-control. It, it also person. helped that his mother-in-law lived at the White House for the last eight years. Right. Oh well. <laughs> well he, Which is a smart move because of all the racist implications associated with being African American. The, the hidden agenda that uh, that a lot of uh, non African Americans feel toward toward blacks in general. So to have his wife present, his mother in law there, um, appearing to be completely above board in all of his contacts, right, private right. And, and official. Right. But he he, had no he he is. I think he really is. I think uh, I I think in hindsight he's going to be uh, viewed as as a a, 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 a a great president. I don't think people realize now. I'm a little bit disgruntled with him because he's not liberal enough. But I, I think when people look back on, on his, <laughs> we've all felt that from the very beginning. Right. From his first year in office in 2008, right. the feeling was, why can't you be more aggressive? But he was doing. He, but he, but I like the work he's done. I'm pretty proud of the work he's, he's, he's done. He's done good work. He's tried to heal. I'm going to. And on that very nice note, he's trying to heal. That's what we have to do. We have to heal the country, Miles. Exactly. The country is divisive. D divided, yes. So you've been watching Life in the Law with Marianne Sasaki and Miles Briner on Think Tech Hawaii. Join us every week, 1 to 1.30. Thank you, Miles, so much. Thank My you. Pleasure. It was so My fun. Pleasure. Always so fun.